Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson. Insert Democrat Socialist here. Runs the Democratic House law for 30 plus years of running. He's promising this and he's stealing that. Where can you get that kind of money? He's using your house like his own piggy bank, gang, 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 gang. You ought to know by now. You can pay off your house here in Illinois, but you can never keep up with the taxes. Oh, how it's always been the plan to have a taxpayer pay, no doubt. Not a matter of if anymore, but when you're moving out. When you're Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. The theme music means it's time for our weekly confab with Ted Dabrowski, President of WirePoints, WirePoints.org, all things Illinois policy related. You know, I raised this issue on Friday during our uh, open mic segment, and then I posted about it over the weekend. I was fascinated by the responses on on Twitter from uh, you know, those who disagree with my position. I'm talking about this new time off ordinance that's making its way through the Chicago City Council to be on Brandon's desk where it will be signed into effect. There's an op-ed in uh, Crane Chicago Business, the anti-business business business rag. 120 restaurants, 121 restaurant tours signed the op-ed. The 121 restaurant tours who signed this op-ed have invested in the city of Chicago financially and emotionally over many years. We have created jobs, helped to find neighborhoods, increased the city's tax revenue, and given this great city a world-class reputation for food and hospitality. We built homes, raised our kids, served as Chicago ambassadors, traveled from around the world. Our industry has been under siege for almost four years. Hundreds of Chicago restaurants, clo- restaurants closed during the pandemic. We're now fighting rising fi- uh, food and supply prices, shipping delays, guests afraid of crime and COVID, and the worst inflation in 50 years. With a total disregard for these struggles, in just the last four-week period alone, the city of Chicago has issued us a double whammy with the elimination of the tip credit and the highest PTO, pay time off standards, and employer obligations of any big city in America. Arguments often cited other cities such as San Francisco as a beacon of why these policies work. By most estimations, these cities are recognized to be among the worst places in America in which to open a restaurant. Restaurants make 4% profit on average. 42 cents of every dollar goes to labor. 27 cents of every dollar goes to the cost of goods sold. 7 cents goes to rent. 20 cents goes to everything else. Without major changes, including price hikes and worker layoffs, the Chicago restaurant skyline will lose its identity as the best food city in America. Um, And by the way, that doesn't even contemplate the fact that uh, so many of these restaurants are still keeping the COVID surcharge on your tabs, if you haven't noticed. Uh, this is so interesting because the reaction I got was um, 40, you know, 40 hours, five days of pay time off, five days of sick leave. All the reaction was, you don't care about workers. These uh, small business owners, the independent ones that can't shoulder these burdens very easily, they don't care about your employees. Only the politicians care about somebody else's employees. Only the politicians know how to run somebody else's business. It's fascinating. And as I tried to explain on Friday, uh, the political ruling class hates the small independent operator. You're a nuisance. You go away, good. Hopefully a bigger restaurant group will scoop up your location and do something with it because they can absorb, more easily absorb these costs. And it's just less mouths to feed and less people to deal with. And frankly, they engage in a lot of rent-seeking behavior as well, as you saw during COVID, where some of the big players were very quiet about the shutdowns while the small guys were getting crushed and put out of business as per this op-ed in Cranes. But it all it's all it's all it, this is the minimum and it, otherwise it's inhumane. And, you know, oh, my gosh, you've, you're worried about an extra t- five to ten days off for me. You don't. It, there's just no consideration. Everybody knows better except the operator. Everybody cares more except the operator who is completely interested in having and keeping good employees and keeping them happy, which is the way that you keep them because of how competitive it is, how tight the margins are in restaurants, as described herein. And, you know, they want to be a going concern. That's why they got into business. I, I just, the, the dismissive attitude 
And by the way, I'm not lauding the Illinois Restaurant Association in any way, shape, or form. Their protestations are performative. They're not really going to impose any cost, and the politicians know that, so they can weather it while they get criticism from, you know, gentle criticism, and then they get to position themselves as, look, we're the defenders of the employees against those fat cats making all the money in the restaurant business who won't even provide uh, 40 hours of PTO, 40 additional hours of PTO and sick leave, sick days, as required by law. Everybody knows better and everybody cares more. And nobody can start from the premises. They just look at it and say, yeah, you should do that for them. Oh, okay. I'll tell you what, as I said to one uh, dope in this confederacy of dunces I was talking to on on Twitter. I'll tell you what, uh, you run my friend's restaurant. You can be the shot caller for my friend's restaurant if I get to be the shot caller for your business. I'm going to tell you how much you can make and all of the other restrictions on how you uh, go about your daily business. How about that? That sounds you, you up, reasonable. You up for that? No, of course nobody's course up for that. No. It's just all what's reasonable, and there are these other regulations. Right, exactly. There are all these other regulations. That's the point. This isn't about looking at this singularly. It's about using this PTO, pay this time off ordinance that's coming uh, up the river, to say the larger point which is what the one I just made every direction from every direction. Somebody's in your pocket or telling you how to run your business. And this is just the latest example. It's not the only one. So you want to switch out this ordinance for relief uh, on another mandate or tax? No, of course not. And if you oppose it, then you don't care about your employees, says the outside world who has who mostly particularly the politicians never have to live in a bottom line reality. It's so infuriating. And the moralizing is the worst part about it. Moralizing from a place of ignorance. Is there any more lethal combination? For more on this, Ted, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Hey, good morning, Dan. Good morning, Amy. I think, you know, I think what most people don't understand is that the, the bureaucrats that set all these rules, you know, these, these are not, I hate to say, there, many of them are not smart in the sense that they've never run a business they're not from the private in any sector. sense they're not smart in any sense yeah but go you know, ahead. there might be a few that's why i don't want to be too but you know there's, there's i'm sure there's a few good good ones out there but you know many of them are now socialists so they don't even care about profits uh you know but most most have no clue and so this is really easy to appeal to the public by saying they're going to do some some public virtue of you know we're going to do this uh pay time off but uh, they have no idea what it, what it means to run a business how to how to make profits and you know and it's you know restaurant business is really really tough i mean you can you know that by seeing how long you know some of my favorite restaurants are all gone they couldn't survive yeah and, most uh, restaurants you know, last most you know, restaurants don't last as long as the average nfl player i mean that's that's the reality yeah and so um this is this is a big deal about how how you know a lot of this is being taken from the public sector. Here's what probably people, a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, teachers in the public sector schools, um, you know, they get up to 15 days a year of, of uh, sick leave. And, and here's the thing. If they don't use it, they get to, to bank it right. and accumulate yeah. it for their entire career. So this is just, uh, you know, if you see how, how expensive schools are, well, this is what you're going to do to the businesses. It's going to make it hard for many to, to, to stay profitable. And people forget, too, because of the, you know, state of emergency we were under for COVID for what? How many months was that? How many years? Uh, if they got sick with COVID and they didn't have to prove it, they didn't even th count as sick days. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know we see this all the time. All these all these different rules coming from you know it, it's a in the end it's a bunch of uh, basic socialist type uh, you know industrial planning type uh, mentality that uh, they know best. Um, I do enjoy this uh, story. Another story about Stacey Davis Gates. We had the story a few weeks ago about sending her kid to a. Uh, private school but it's okay for her because she's her she's who she is and other people are not her so that's why it's okay and now we find that she has a homestead deduction uh, for her home in South Bend where apparently she had a driver's license when she was uh, stopped for a traffic incident traffic violation but yet she's registered to vote in Illinois uh, as of 2014 
I'm all very, I'm a little bit confused, but I got, I'm going to go where, where she has the homestead exemption because she doesn't have it on her, on her property in Illinois. She has it on her property in South Bend. So that makes her an Indiana resident, which means she is no longer under the Proft rule. She yes. is no longer able to comment on anything that happens in <laughs> Chicago or Illinois because she's not a resident. Yeah, well, Dan, as long as you're commenting, she gets to. I don't know. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, this is just, yeah, again, again, you know, rules for thee, but not for me. Uh, this is a typical example of that. Um, yeah, she, she's gonna play. She's gonna play the system. They all do. So I, I, you know, I've got nothing to say. It's, it's, it's not surprising. You know, every time we, we hear these kind of things, it's just uh, par for the course for Chicago. And you know, she's that perfect example, starting with the with the school example and sending your kid to a private school after everything she said about private schools. Uh, and here you go. Now she's doing the the same kind of thing on her tax breaks. All right. Speaking of the union, teachers unions uh, had. They gave $1.5 million to lawmakers ahead of this Invest in Kids vote, which should take place, what, this week? During the last week of the yeah, veto it's, session? Uh, this is, it's today, today, tomorrow, and, 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 and Thursday are the last three days of what's called the veto session. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Invest in Kids Act, this is, again, the, the 9,700 scholarship program that, that uh, either dies this week or, or, or they extend it in some way, in some form. Um, you know, it's, it's likely to die, but... Uh, you know, the, the, it's unsurprising that, that a lot of lawmakers don't want to bring this thing up and let they, it's unsurprising they want to let it die because they've received so much money from the unions uh, over, the, over the years. Uh, the unions hate school choice. They hate private schools and uh, they'll do everything they can to crush the, the Investing Kids Act this week. Yeah, no, I got the missive from Illinois Families for Public Schools are a good group. Legislators back in Springfield, three more days, uh, which the General Assembly could take action to continue its Illinois voucher program. Let's uh, make sure you call them to make sure that it sunsets. Make the call to sunset that voucher program. You don't want those uh, 10,000 kids, mostly minority kids from lower income families, to have access to better schools. I mean, you know, could you imagine uh, how? how damaging that will continue to be to government schools. Maybe that's why those 10,000 kids uh, in um, private schools, thanks to the tax credit scholarship, that's why the public schools are performing so poorly uh, in Chicago and really throughout the rest of the state per the report card. We need those 10,000 kids back in the government schools and everything will be okay. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about how bad the results are at the public schools, but that, you know, something that Dan, you and I talked the other day, and, and we t- we published it this morning, just to make sure everybody's clear, how much we're spending for that failure. So, uh, you know, CPS, we've, we've talked about the all-in cost when you add up everything. It's thirty thousand dollars per kid. Oh my gosh. Um, it's twenty. It's twenty-nine something. So almost thirty thousand. But at the, at the Illinois level, across all the schools, um, our, our total spending has jumped up to about forty-five billion a year, and that's twenty-four thousand. That's the all-in cost. You'll usually hear a much lower number. That's the amount spent on operating. They, they like to. They like to. We fall into the trap of playing the smaller number, like eighteen thousand and stuff like that. No, it's it's twenty-four thousand a kid, and and you know that's again another reason just to continue the Investing Kids Act and school choice. We're spending you know so much money, the second highest property taxes, and yet you know most of these kids can't read and do math. So um, it's it's amazing how much we're spending now. It's it's really understanding why everybody's property taxes are so high right now. Um, so what about uh, getting, I mean, just on another topic, too. I mean, we talked uh, the other day about um, the um, uh, number of vacancies. Uh, something like 5,000 classrooms are uh, vacant inside in, in Chicago public school system, and so that would be great places to uh, set up makeshift accommodations for migrants so we can keep the buses rolling and the planes flying. And well, and and welcoming all the individuals from wherever they hail, and then um, let's get. But but I mean, Jonathan Jackson, I thought had a point. The congresswoman that yeah, this is Illinois is a sanctuary state, not a sanctuary city. Chicago is a city. Illinois is a state. They're both sanctuaries. So let's start uh, repurposing field houses in uh, the collar counties. Let's you know make sure that the collar counties uh, are given. Equal opportunity in the interest of equity, equal opportunity to live their values as well. I mean, uh, I would hate for Naperville and Hinsdale uh, and Lombard and Glen Ellen to miss out on this. <laughs> right. I mean, there's all kinds of places that people could be put. You know, you, you guys did uh, your the paper you're involved, the Chicago City Wire wrote about that. I guess that was yesterday. All these empty schools. Right. There's all kinds of empty facilities everywhere. Um, you know, it's more like the Babylon Bee piece where. 
uh, let's just move all the immigrants into these schools, you know, um, you know, what is it, Manly High School, which yeah, Manly High School is 5% in Chicago, 5% utilized. There's a lot of space there. Same thing for Douglas High School, 5% uplift, only 8% full. You could, you could put a lot of people in there. The, you know, the, the heat's already on, the water's running, so uh, those, those places are ready. And, and they're uh, staffed. And they're staffed. And they're staffed. Yeah, they got you know janitors, et cetera. So um, now, of course, I had a hard time. I wanted to write that piece, but I had a hard time because I don't want people to think you know, we have to be careful that whatever we do perpetuates the problem and actually invites more immigrants. And and again, you know, you know we're, we're pro, pro immigrant in, in the right way, but uh, certainly the easier we make it for for these thousands and, and you know tens of thousands and, and probably hundreds of thousands of immigrants, the easier we make it easier we make it for them to come here, the more we'll come. And that's precisely the problem. So, uh, but yeah, it would be for, uh, for, for good measure to have all these uh, places that are, have their, their hate has no home here to, to house a lot of these immigrants too. Ted Dabrowski, president of WirePoints, wirepoints.org, all things Illinois policy related. Thanks, Ted. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. The more you listen, the more you listen, the more you'll know. This is Chicago's Morning Answer. Morning Answer on AM 560. The Answer. Hey, business owners, are you?